Welcome. Welcome to the celebration of the life of Carl Piester. On behalf of all of my family, thank you for sharing this day with us to celebrate my father's wonderful, amazing life. It, it's fitting to be in the shadow of the Campanile, which we'll see once the videos are, are done. We'll open the screens. On the, on the Berkeley campus that he loved so much and where he put so much of his, his life. It's not surprising that many of my dad's friends today are in South Bend <laughs> cheering for the Cal Bears. As a, as a fierce Cal sports supporter for at least 80 years of his life, I, I think he would, he would think they made the right decision on that one. Uh, although I did have a, a, a former chancellor approach me and say that my dad is one of the few people for whom he would have missed that game, or for whom he did, in fact, miss that game. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to express our deep thanks uh, to the College of Engineering and to the Dean of Engineering, Sue J. King Liu, for sponsoring the event, and specifically to Jane Anderson and Karen Holterman, uh, who worked closely with my sister Claire in planning every, every detail. So thank you very much. We're touched by the array of friends, family, and university nobility who are with us. Uh, and thank you all for, for being here, for coming. And I'd finally like to call out among the many distinguished guests, I believe that we have several members of the widely feared and respected Byron Park Balloon Volleyball team with us today. <clears throat> A team that my father uh, enjoyed so much in the last few years. So welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Let's get started. It's difficult for me to separate University of California, particularly Berkeley, from my life. It is my life. It has been my life. Well, I was born in um, Central Valley in Stockton, went to uh, Stockton schools, lived on a farm, and uh, really enjoyed the, uh, the life of a, what my mother called a country boy, and uh, had an excellent education in Stockton public school system. Carl Piester entered Berkeley, but was called away to serve his country in World War II. It turned out that in uh, July of 1943, after I finished a year here, I was um, brought to active duty in, in the Navy in a program called the Navy V-12 program. And I was sent back to Berkeley to, um, since I was an engineer, to finish my undergraduate degree in civil engineering. So I, I finished uh, Berkeley in 32 months. After the war, Carl Piester completed his doctoral studies and began his career as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at UC Berkeley, while continuing to serve his country in the Naval Reserves. He later rose to become dean of the College of Engineering. I was dean at a time when state resources were really beginning to drop dramatically, so it was my responsibility to uh, set up an organization and a program to bring in uh, resources from outside world, from private donations, from individuals and corporations. Carl Piester developed one of the most successful fundraising organizations on campus in an effort that culminated in the construction of Soda Hall. During his tenure as dean, he also saw his youngest son earn a master's degree. Dad was still dean, and so we agreed beforehand, you know, so, so he's up there shaking hands with all of the doctoral students and then the master's students and then all the all the undergraduates which is actually an incredibly grueling thing on your hand his hand would be sore for days after after doing that uh, and but we, we agreed that um, when I got up there instead of a handshake we'd do a, a high five and, and then there's there's dad he says come on come on you're you know and he's got his, he's got his hand I was like oh yeah that's right that's right we're supposed to so so we we did a high five on stage after completing his appointment as Dean of Engineering, Carl Piester put himself at the disposal of UC President David Gardner. He asked me if, if I would go down as, as an interim chancellor of Santa Cruz because he, he characterized Santa Cruz as a place that was virtually ungovernable at that time. It was in cha a chaotic state. So I foolishly accepted that, that challenge and went to UC Santa Cruz. Um, it turned out that I stayed more than a year, I stayed five years. Based on his own life experiences, Carl Piester worked to promote diversity at Santa Cruz and later at the office of the president. I came as a um, perfectly prepared young white male and the culture shock between my life um, 
in the Central Valley in a, in a very good high school. And being on my own here, the culture shock was something that I didn't deal well with in my first year. And I think as a result of that experience, I, I became uh, much more uh, sensitive uh, as a, first as a dean and later as a chancellor to the problems of adjustment of students that come from minority cultures. In, in 2004, uh, in the fall, uh, Chancellor Bergeneau asked me to chair a task force to um, recommend a program to re rehabilitate Memorial Stadium. And that report, which he accepted, uh, led to my being appointed as senior associate to the chancellor uh, to oversee the program, which is now is called the Southeast Campus Integrated Projects, which includes the re rehabilitation of the stadium and a new building for law and business. So it's a tremendous honor to be selected among the uh, the thousands and thousands of alumni as the Alumnus of the Year. So I'm very grateful, I'm very honored and humbled by that award. Daniel Coit Gilman, in his inaugural address, said, this is a university of the people and for the people of California. And the challenge for us in the 21st century is to make the University of California a university of the people and for the people of California, given the dramatic change that's occurring in uh, the statement, who are the people of California? I welcome each of you to the Berkeley campus today to remember and celebrate the life of our dear friend and colleague, Carl Piester. I so miss being with you today, but I'm with many of Carl's friends at a place he'd love to have been, at Notre Dame, cheering on the Golden Bears. He spent a lifetime of Saturdays in Memorial Stadium doing just that. I was so moved by Carl's words in the video you just saw. Everyone who knew him could see what the University of California meant to him. From his first days as a Berkeley undergraduate, he was captivated by the university, the promise it afforded, the discoveries it heralded, and the lives it could change. That passion for UC abided and intensified over the next 80 years of his life. Today, I can see Carl's devotion to the university, his vision and his guiding hand all across our campus. It's in the increasingly diverse faces of our students, in the excellence of the faculty he recruited, in the buildings he helped erect, and in research that is collaborative, cross-disciplinary, and serves the public good. Most of all, for me, it's in the standard he set for integrity, care, and justice in every decision he made. What a giant he was in the field of engineering and in higher education. I prized his friendship and I learned so much from him. He was a true model and mentor to me and I know to many others. My thoughts are with you all today and with Carl, a remarkable citizen of the University of California. Good afternoon. Very. Very good to see all of you here, here this afternoon, and uh, uh, honored and privileged to be here to say a few words on behalf of our friend and colleague, Carl Piester. This is an interesting time uh, each fall in the universities. This is the time that rankings come out in the um, much maligned, but we occasionally focus on uh, U.S. News uh, report. And uh, we noted that this year, as is the case routinely, the number one public university in the country and often in the world is UC Berkeley. This is an incredible campus of incredible people doing things and incredible things. And we all receive great uh, accolades uh, uh, based on the contributions of the campus. When we think about what it really is that makes this such a special place, it's not the, the buildings or uh, it's not really so much the things that are done here, but really the people here who do those things. It's the, the students and the faculty and the staff and the years of a commitment to being the very best that it's possible to be. And Carl came here because of that and became a part of that. And then from that really rose to be a leader in that environment. Leader 
to be recognized as being the best among the best and someone who could help lead the best forward. When you're in first place, when you're at the front of the pack, the pathway forward isn't something that is defined or clear or set out for you. You have to see it. You have to have the, the vision and the commitment to really push forward and define what that path is going to be for others. And he did that here. He uh, did the best that he could be to be the best that he could be. And then he did the best that he could do to make us the best that we could be. Uh, that was uh, on display often and in many ways and really caused him to be tapped then to go to Santa Cruz uh, to help to lead that campus forward to in fact even widen his influence on the pathways forward that people would have in making their lives in our world better. I, he described the campus in, in the videos being ungovernable. I was uh, going to, things don't change, uh, but uh, I was going to describe it really as being like a wild horse at the time, like a lot of energy a lot of passion, not so much focus direction. And his being there helped to really bring that energy together and the wild horse turned into more of a racehorse and really moved forward and then followed by Marcy and George and, and now Cindy um, uh, uh, and Denise uh, briefly, that racehorse has become an AAU member. It's uh, become a real powerhouse nationally in the quality of the work that it, it provides for its uh, community and for our university. Broadly, so he did a wonderful thing in taming that and moving moving it forward. Uh, a good for a farm boy. Uh, the, something else. Then after that uh, period was done, he came back to the university, and again, nice to hear it reflected in his own words in the in the video. He had done what he could to make himself outstanding. He'd done what he could to be the best for all of us, but he wanted that all of us to really be much broader and to open the university to the broad array of people who might benefit from from the ability to study here, and who might make our university a continually better place moving forward. And so he went then to the office of the president. We first worked together when he was chancellor, and I was still a, a professor at UCSF. But then we worked together when I was in the office of the president along with him and worked on the really important work of reaching out more broadly to people across California to help the texture and the fabric of the university better reflect who we wanted to be as a state, who we wanted to be as a, a nation. His leadership style was something that I think was special to all of us. You know, there's a, you can sort of uh, talk the talk, that's, that's great, a little more effort to walk the walk. In his case, he really was the thing. He was the goal that we all wanted to be. He was a gracious and thoughtful person. He was a committed scientist, but he was really connected and engaged with his community. And all of those who, of us who were around him could feel that and bond with him and join with him in, in that journey. So I would say that uh, in uh, some, that the pleasure of working with him uh, for all of those years is something that helped us to be better in our own world. The, the motto of our university is uh, fiat lux, let there be light. He himself was a light, the beacon that we were all able to follow and help to illuminate the pathway forward. You know, he, as we say, will be missed, but honestly, we were changed by him, and we are a better place because of that, and it's uh, an honor to have a few moments to celebrate his incredibly impactful life. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone here. I would like to extend a special warm welcome to Carl's family and all of his friends and colleagues who are here to celebrate his life. As Dean of the College of Engineering, it is my honor to represent the college and to tell you a little bit about his, his impact on our community. The college has been Carl's uh, academic home here at UC Berkeley ever since he was an undergraduate student. When Carl joined the Berkeley Engineering faculty in 1952, he became part of a remarkable group of professors who solidified the department's reputation of offering the nation's best undergraduate and graduate programs in civil engineering. And that is a distinction that the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering still holds today. He began to build what's called the Piester machine, Research Machine, a long line of stellar students in structural engineering and mechanics. Carl's research group pioneered the use of computers to analyze the design of buildings, bridges, and other structures. He was a founder of the field of computational mechanics. 
For his contributions to the field of engineering, he was elected to the US National Academy of Engineering, which is one of our profession's highest honors. In my own work as dean today, I see how Carl's vision and leadership has shaped our college to be the preeminent public school of engineering in the world. During his tenure as dean, he opened the Bechtel Engineering Center, he oversaw the addition of a fifth floor on top of Corey Hall, and he led the planning and fundraising for Soda Hall. Now back then, fundraising was not a day-to-day -day activity for deans, but Carl saw the important role that philanthropy would, pay, would play for our university. And so he did build up a nascent fundraising program that today is flourishing and is his model for other academic units across the Berkeley campus. Carl also built up our faculty. He recognized that excellence in research and innovation is enhanced by including a diversity of talent, perspectives, and ideas. When he took office, the number of women and underrepresented minority faculty in the College of Engineering could be counted on one hand. Well, he set out to change that, putting the college on a trajectory of change that continues today. Carl championed broad and equitable access to the University of California, not only for faculty, but for students. And he worked tirelessly to build systems of support for women and underrepresented minority students. Long before many acknowledged that there was a problem, Carl was already working at a national scale to break down barriers and broaden the pathways to engineering careers from building from kindergarten to graduate school to the workforce. Carl also expanded our intellectual horizons. He encouraged interdisciplinary approaches to research. He recognized that engineering leaders should be skilled in collaboration, not only across disciplinary boundaries, but also across organizational, national, and cultural boundaries. Thus, he made a number of important international connections for the college, especially in Asia and the Pacific Rim. Carl believed that engineers should be leaders not only in their fields, but also in academia and the government. He set an outstanding example of this when he stepped up as chancellor of UC Santa Cruz. He saw that at least two, he saw two of his faculty whom recruited there to become, go on to become university presidents. And the programs that he fostered here at Berkeley in the College of Engineering helped to shape three African-American engineering students who today lead three major research universities. With so many achievements, Carl's impact was more than what he did. It was how he did it, with integrity and a passion for ensuring opportunity and social justice for all. This is the Carl Piester that we are celebrating today. At Berkeley Engineering, we'll be honoring his legacy long into the future. UC President Richard Atkinson was one of Carl's closest friends and colleagues. He resides today in San Diego and was unable to travel to be with us here today. But he asked that we read a brief remembrance and I'm honored to do so now. So Richard says, in the fall of 1980, I was just beginning my chancellorship at UC San Diego. David Saxon, the president who recruited me for the job, called one day and he said that he was sending the chair of the statewide academic senate to talk to me about shared governance. I'd spent many years on the faculty at Stanford and I think it was David's view that I could see how, that I could use a tutorial in how real faculty governance works. <laughs> the person he sent was Carl Piester, an inspired choice. I gained useful insights into UC's sometimes Byzantine system of shared governance, but more important, I gained a wise colleague and wonderful friendship for 20, 42 years. Carl had a deep-seated conviction about the role of universities, especially public ones like the University of California. He insisted that the academic profession demands allegiance to the larger ideals that universities have come to stand for. There are many examples of Carl's active devotion to these ideals. I want to mention one that I know firsthand. In 1995, a few weeks before I became president, the Board of Regents voted to end affirmative action in admission to the university. 
At my request, Carl agreed to lead the most ambitious outreach enterprise the university has ever undertaken. The creation of a vast network of partnerships with K through 12 schools, teachers, students, and underserved communities throughout the state. This was and is essential to UC's ability to continue attracting disadvantaged and minority students to our campuses. Carl's approach was characteristic of everything he did. Where others saw a crisis, he saw possibilities. UC had, a long, had long focused on the gate, admission to the university. Now, he argued, it must focus its energies on the path, working with schools to help students successfully enter the gate. He saw this as essential to UC's land-grant mission, to use its educational role to cultivate the state's most important wealth, its true gold, the talent and potential of its young people. His leadership was simply indis indispensable to UC's transition to the post-affirmative action world. Carl's legacy defines, sub, defies summing up. He has won a lasting place in the history of the University of California. He used his superb gifts of mind and character to shape the values of his profession and the culture of the academic community. This is the common thread that shines through a long, richly productive life. And the best way to honor his memory is to follow his example. Thank you. Go Bears. <laughs> we haven't had enough of that yet. <clears throat> I'm Phil, Carl's only brother. Just the two of us. We had no brothers or sisters, brothers or sisters. We're very close growing up together in our Central Valley dairy farm. In fact, I spent a fair amount of my time as an undergraduate at Cal, commuting back and forth between our home there in Stockton, where I did a lot of milking of the cows, and my classes at UCB. There's one factor here that I, you can't overemphasize. Carl spent more than 70 years with the university foremost in his mind, Amazing, 70 years, that's the better part of a century. <clears throat> I think it always impressed me working with Carl on a day-to-day -day basis was the thoughtfulness that he had for his fellow human beings. Perhaps the best way to say it, Carl was just a good guy and he would not change from that. Good time to bring in a little narrative here. There at our home, my mom, incidentally, was a Berkeley class of 1917, which is now well over a century ago. She was anxious that her sons, just the two of us, would fill in behind her as a member of the university community. We had kind of a ritual there at our home in Stockton where both we grew up, both of our parents being high school teachers and the, and the Stockton High School faculty. If something really important were to be discussed, it would have to be around the card table Oh, about so big, square. One time, Carl and I were fooling around outside doing something or other, perhaps playing baseball. Mom said, it's time we did some discussing here about your future after you get out of high school. Or Carl would have been perhaps uh, in his junior or senior year at Stockton High and me following in behind him. So he, she set up the card table in the front, row, front row, lawn, brought out four, three chairs, Carl and me and her, 
And she had a big map of California, which kind of gets from the AAA now, the spreading the length of California, clear from Humboldt State down to the University of San Diego, UCSD. We got all done with our discussion of each campus individually. <laughs> started to leave, her mom started to leave, and as she was walking away from us, after extolling the virtues of, of Berkeley, she turned and almost as an afterthought said, <laughs> I can hear her voice right now, I'm hesitating a bit here. I want you now to consider what we've talked about here in terms of universities in California. To choose wisely. And as she walked away from us, almost as an afterthought, she turned and turned to us and said, unless you choose Berkeley, you're paying your own way. <laughs> yeah. Well put. And that's exactly what she would have done, too. <clears throat> but the thoughtfulness aspect was something that's very true to me. Carl had others on his mind as he went through his academic rituals. Dad was more of a Stanford type guy, which is okay. You got to have something for them to look up to. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> One of the things that Carl and I did as youngsters in high school age, and there on up into the first couple of years at Berkeley, we go on a pack pack trips into the High Sierra mainly the southern end down from Bishop on south. And what we did then, we had to have something to tie us together. Back in those days, this would have been right after World War II, 1946, 47, and through there. There were no guides trail guides available at that time commercially. They came in later in large numbers. But at that time, there wasn't anything except one classic example, Starr's Guide, named after Pete Starr, who was the son of Walter Starr, a very successful Stanford attorney. Am I correct there, Frank? I thought I was, yeah. The, <laughs> what we would do is start every day and end every day, stick our heads out from our sleeping bags. Something that tied us together was a poem written by Pete Starr, Walter Starr Jr. Pete was a recent graduate of Stanford Law School. He started his book and ended it with a poem that he himself had composed called The Mountain's Call, Mountain's Apostrophe Call, by Walter Peter Starr, Jr. He did this in, I believe, it was July 1903. It's a beautiful poem. And you can see where Carl was inspired by it. Because this kind of, we start every day with reciting the poem and end every day before, as we we're sacked out in our sleeping bags in the high country. The mountains call. God's wilderness is calling me to shining summits, bright and cool. The mountain trails from snow are free. The flashing trout are in the pool. All winter long, the lurid spell of glittering lakes and towering trees, 
of rushing streams and pine trees smell and flowering meadows haunted me. Of all the peace on earth, there's none. Imagine Carl saying this now, as all those of you who knew him, as I did. Of all the peace on earth, there's none, like evening in my campfire dream. No shrine like God's own starlit dome, nor wine like water from my stream. What song like Sylvan Solitude, stirred softly by the snow-kissed breeze, or water oozles sweet nose tune to swirling streams, glad melodies. And this is the last verse, which is beautifully done. Lure of Sierra, wild and free, jewels deep set in shining skies. Defiant bottoms beckon me to glory and dream in their paradise. I know we all have our own concept of the hereafter. I like to think that that's where Carl is now, growing and, and dreaming in the paradise provided by our beautiful mountains here in California. An example of his concern for others, he started it at Berkeley, I think, right after World War II. I followed him three years later. He's three and a half years older than I. And this is good. He said, Phil, I want you to pay attention to what I'm telling you now, because it's going to be very important in the future. At that time, I was a, Jew, a freshman at Berkeley, wondering where I wanted to spend my career. I started in in pre-med, but I never really was deeply concerned about work, trying to cure sick people. So I, I did something else. Phone rang one day. I was a, living at Bulls Hall, just north of campus, above the stadium. I spent seven years at Bulls Hall. Three and a half as an undergraduate, two and a half later on as a graduate student. Had my meals there. Bulls is a wonderful place to, to, to spend your time as an undergrad. Phone rang. I was sitting at my desk there at Bulls. It was Carl. He says, Phil, I think I've come across something in the new general catalog that may be of interest to you. There's a professor, there's a professor down in the life science building named Starker Leopold. Starker had just completed his doctorate at Berkeley in Berkeley's vaunted Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, which is a, you're not gonna find a better place than that. It's made a huge impact on me. So later on, as I went into the workforce myself, I worked for the State Department of Fish and Wildlife for nearly 40 years. What I learned there from Starker I have to excuse me, it's an emotional time. Led me throughout my career. He said, Phil, I want you to learn a lot here, what I can teach you and what my colleagues here in the museum can teach you. Indeed, it worked that way. And so I was able as a, profes as a professional working for the State Department of Fish and Wildlife to make major badly needed changes inspired by the thinking of Starker and his father Aldo. Many of you may know who Aldo was. He wrote this famous Santa Clara Almanac, which even today is probably the textbook for environmental philosophy, environmental ethics. And so this allowed me then to make major changes from the naming of my organization, State Department of Fish and Wildlife, from California Fish and Game. 
people interested in fish and wildlife resources are not necessarily fishermen or hunters. They wanted a broader perspective. Their legislature rec recognized this and went ahead and made the changes and turned them into law under the California Fish and Game Code. So this is a good example of Carl's kind of insidious, in a way, comments relative to his brother, his profession, to his family, and to society generally, which I think is what any public servant should do. It'd be concerned with what the decisions I make, how this will affect the populace, the people of California. Other states have picked up on this now and are making similar changes in their own legislation to allow them to go to bigger and broader things. And again, in the museum there at Berkeley, not too far from where we're sitting right now, these decisions, decisions were being made that led me throughout my career. And I'm sure others would repeat the same statements that Carl made that I just repeated to you. I thank each of you for being here, for recognizing my brother, whom I dearly love. Continue. You know, when a person dies after spending a long life of public service, you don't just disappear. In Carl's case particularly, he'll be influencing engineers for the next century or more by what the examples he set. One of his, the highlights of Carl's life was when his son, Chris, applied for a doctoral program at Stanford and was rejected. <laughs> was accepted from Berkeley, which was not surprising. But when he found that out, I've never, he, as is I now, have a hard time even talking about it. Because I, same emotions overcome me the same way. Thank you again for being here and honoring my great brother and everything he's provided for you, your relatives, and for future generations of California. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It was uh, my good fortune to be the academic vice chancellor when Carl Piester arrived at UCSC in 1991 as the interim chancellor. I had known of Carl from his time as dean of engineering at Berkeley. From our first meeting, I could sense his personal warmth and connection to people, his deep commitment to education and to the UC system, and his open and always inquiring mind. Clearly, he was also a courageous adventurer. In 1990, UCSC was going through a rocky period. The horses were bucking at that point, I think. With the outgoing chancellor having gotten crosswise with the politics of the city of Santa Cruz and with the faculty senate. It takes courage and confidence to become the highest campus authority on a campus that claims question authority as one of its mottos. There were other storms on the horizon. UCSC was due for its next long-range development plan, always contentious at Santa Cruz, and the prospects for state-supported budget increases to match the anticipated campus growth were looking dim because California as a whole was facing a structural budget crunch. Undaunted, or at least undeterred, Carl arrived at UCSC with enthusiasm and the energy to seek out and listen to the multitude of perspectives to get to know the campus and its values. One well-known value at UCSC was undergraduate teaching. From its founding, UCSC strived to rebalance the dual prongs of research and teaching. Carl brought sterling credentials in that regard. Beyond being a member of the National Academy of Engineering, he was chair of a task force to re-examine and broaden the 
for the criteria for advancement in the University of California. Carl had a deep understanding of the mission of UC under the California Master Plan, a command of the policies that governed that conduct, and respect for the practice of shared governance. All were essential in tackling the issues at UCSC. He valued collegiality among faculty from many disciplines, and that resonated with the proponents of the college system at UCSC. Carl was the personification of the best of the UC system, and that immediately commanded respect on the campus. Of course, Carl didn't arrive alone. His wife, Rita, was an important member of his leadership team, particularly in activities that linked UCSC to the greater Santa Cruz community. Rita, my wife, Eileen, and a wonderful donor, donor, Ann Levin, were involved in raising the visibility of UCSC and making it more welcoming to off-campus constituencies. They became so well-known around town that some quietly called them the big three as a shorthand. I always appreciated that Carl recognized how valuable Rita was to UCSC, and he tried hard to get her some official recognition. When Carl settled in, he rapidly recognized that the design of the campus administration was the legacy of its early years and the initial conception of the college system. The idea of a campus that remains small while growing large, a UCSC tagline, is all well and good in spirit, but healthy growth calls for an administration that can run a large campus professionally and efficiently. Carl made major changes to the administrative structure and personnel to prepare for a bigger future. Quite early on, and at the urging of the faculty, the interim in his title was removed, a sign of the campus's embrace of Carl and his leadership. I've never had a better working relationship as part of a two-person team. He and I always thought it remarkable that a campus externally known for its liberal arts would end up being headed by two engineers. In Carl's second year, the UC system was hit with budget cuts that translated to a 12.5% cut in state funding for the campus. Despite clamoring from virtually all sides for special consideration and the demonstrations to try to skew decision making, Berkeley knows about that, I think, uh, Carl maintained clarity in his principles. As Carl himself put it, it's very important to be honest and open with people, to be consistent, and to not be blown away by situational or political forces, to make your principles and your positions clear to people, and then stick to them. I will not attempt to list all the initiatives that Carl guided. I will simply touch on a few. He initiated a comprehensive long-range development planning process to prepare for eventual expansion to meet the needs of the growing California population while respecting the environment and the natural beauty of the campus. He saw that with the changing demographics of California, UCSC had to be welcoming and successful in educating new first-generation students, many of whom were Latinos. His Leadership Opportunity Awards program was one element of that initiative. He defended the careful use of affirmative action when it was under attack. It's worth noting that UCSC is now a Hispanic-serving institution. Uh, excuse me. Carl reached out to other educational institutions around the Monterey Bay, including the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, to forge new cooperative relations. He set the stage for long-awaited establishment of the School of Engineering, brought to fruition in 1997 with the help from Jack Baskin. Carl's success at Santa Cruz was very much a reflection of his personal character and his values and how he lived them every day. He was ready to meet people in our community where they were and to get to know them as people. Carl was a beacon of decency, integrity, and just common sense, who had a natural compassion for others and a generosity of spirit. As a diligent student of Catholicism and religion, Carl had probed what it meant to be a human being. He never stopped questioning and re-examining the foundations of his personal philosophy. 
For example, over the years that I knew him, he grappled with and changed his thinking about same-sex relationships, an evolution that did not come easily to men of his generation. Carl was wise because he was always thoughtful and he gave me much valuable advice. One day we were discussing the challenges of public speaking. You can always be comfortable if you speak from the heart, Carl said. And so I give my heartfelt thanks for the blessing of having known and worked with Carl. He was a kind mentor and a dear friend and I will always miss him. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm bringing my laptop so I can pretend I have PowerPoint slides here. Just a normal presentation. That was really lovely, Michael. Um, I thought I would focus on um, a little window of diversity and inclusion from my perspective of dad's work on diversity and inclusion from my perspective. Um, each child gets something unique from his or her parents, and that is certainly true for me and all of my siblings. I know one of the gifts I received was a love for science and engineering. While that was not unique to me in the family, it was unique at the time that he was giving encouragement to a young woman in that area. By the time I was ready for college and picking freshman courses with a major in mind, it seemed completely natural to me to pick mechanical engineering with advisory comments from my dad. Because I attended the Cardinal School down the road, the ratio was two to one men to women, so it didn't seem that unusual that there were very few women in the class. Classes, I think maybe 10%. Pam could probably verify that for me. Um, as we've, as we've talked about all, all day and all the news has always been that dad had a strong interest in diversity and inclusion. One way he got that perspective, I think, is from, from the women in his life who knew something about inclusion and exclusion. Of course, as those of you who work with him know, he, he surrounded himself with strong women in all facets of his life. At home, his wife, our mother, and four daughters, the university, church, and social activities as well. My brother will be talking about our family, so I won't move, speak any more about mom. Dad made a point of surrounding himself with these intelligent women who he supported and who also supported him. There are, I think, are a lot of them here today. I will comment only on the ones that I personally got to know and probably only a few of those, so please don't be offended if, if I don't say your name. My father had the good fortune, of course, to start life with his mother, who Phil commented on, Mary Kimball Smith, who was a school teacher with uh, a degree from Cal and a heart of gold, as well as a really great sense of humor. And her curiosity and sense of humor, I think, were repeated in the women that dad associated himself with later in life. As I embarked on my engineering studies, my father was working hard here to improve the ratio of women and minorities in the College of Engineering. I believe he was successful in bringing in a higher ratio in Berkeley than we had at Stanford at that time, and he was very proud of that. I am proud to say one of my very good friends from college and from mechanical engineering, Dr. Pamela Ibeck, President Emerita of University of the Pacific, expect, expected, accepted a tenure-track position here, much to my father's joy. This was a relief to me, as Dad had told me he would be able to retire only when I joined the faculty. And, and I was depending on Pam to fill in that void. Pam's comment in a tribute to Dad for his 95th birthday celebration was, your most important legacy is the number of people whose lives you have touched with your wisdom, compassion, and support. I am one of those people. Thank you, Pam. Another woman engineer Dad encouraged was Connie Carroll, a CE undergrad and president of the Society of Women Engineers here at Cal. Dad supported her work to expand the chapter as well as the outreach program to target seventh and eighth grade girls for STEM classes. Connie later went on to grad school at Stanford and enlisted Dad's help in her dream of starting a center for entrepreneurship there by, work, uh, by asking him to work with the Stanford Business and Engineering faculty and his discussing his thoughts about the work here with the Haas School and the College of Engineering. After she moved to Europe, she landed an assistant professor job in Spain. She subsequently worked there to develop the uh, 
UCB Engineering Alumni Association in Europe, that internationalization enabled a new channel of international development, something that dad was always working for for the College of Engineering. Karma presented dad with another major force in the form of Merrily Howcamp. Merrily worked with Connie on that project I mentioned and many others in the college. Apparently in the early days of dad's deanship, she was fortunately able to convince him that in fact fundraising was a key part of the dean's job, although in, her, in initial conversations he had told her that he would not be doing it. Without that powerful partnership and no doubt some pushing from Merrily, the funds for many programs mentioned today would not have existed. And they also shared a great love for Bears athletics, sitting in front of dad and my brother at many games with close, very close seats. Merrily, I think, may have been surprised and commented in one of the articles I read that the, you, that the normally caring, people-oriented dean that she knew was yelling at bad calls, even to the point of screaming, kill him, kill him, which he was probably doing today about the fighting Irish. How, how are they doing, by the way? Do we have any news? One of dad's most enduring relationships was with Billy Green, who was assistant to the dean and joined the UCSC team as an advisor to the chancellor. And in dad's words, performed a task more often than she would have liked that is invaluable. She told me the truth as she saw it. No matter how much she knew, I might not like to hear it. And I'm sure she did that graciously because she's such a lovely person. Among other accomplishments, Billy was key to the development of the Leadership Opportunity Award already mentioned, which has supported over 400 students. Billy wrote, if the College of Engineering and UC Santa Cruz were people, Carl Piester would be their hearts. Lastly, there's Germaine Leberge, a kind and brilliant woman who made all the difference to dad and, excuse me, to our family these past 11 years. Breath. A woman who at one point taught school and raised a family, an autodidact, Germaine privately studied law and passed the California bar. Brilliant. She was a senior editor in the regional oral history office in multiple fields and a project director of the California State Archives oral history program. Germaine helped pull dad out of the valley of grief and despair in 2011, truly. And they went on to have many adventures together, traveling internationally and domestically, and in entertaining their vast network of friends, colleagues, and family. Germaine brought joy into dad's life, and for that we're very thankful. Their partnership was full of laughter, reading, and love. There isn't a time to thank all of the people that I would like to thank. There are lots of others. Some, my brother mentioned the, the uh, Byron Park, the Oakwood 5 a.m. work club, workout, the, the church group, the 8 a.m. mass group, lots of others. But I wanted to just comment on these, the women that I have known. I wouldn't be my mother's daughter if I hadn't done so. Our father liked nothing more than gathering around a table for dinner and lively conversation, whether it be with family or friends and colleagues from around the world. Every dinner began with a prayer, thanks for the food, for our family, and ended with a ritual toast. So as we gather here today to celebrate his life, I want to raise one more toast to my dad. It would be a martini. Cheers, and go Bears. To the family of Carl and the extended UC family, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It's a very special day and I really, really appreciate it. Carl had a huge impact on my life the life of my family, and the life of the extended UC family and many of the colleagues that are here. I have known Carl for, for almost 40 years, and we have truly value, I truly value his, friend, his friendship. He was more than a mentor. He was a guiding star. We shared a love of engineering, a deep commitment to family, and a common faith. On the common faith perspective, we shared many conversations on Hans Kung and Taylor de Chardin. And I see that he's quoted in this, this I didn't know this, he was going to be quoted in, the, in the, uh, the flyer. Like many of you, I have an academic title. But to Carl, I was the minion. So I, that's the best title I've ever had. I am the minion.
I was the minion to Carl, and it was a wonderful title. I first met Carl when a newly minted faculty member at UCSB. In 1985, four of us had just arrived fresh off the plane from Bell Labs, and we landed at an NSF engineering research center. We didn't have a clue how to run an engineering research center, so we invited Carl down from Berkeley. Carl came down, and he pointed out that Berkeley was probably a much better home, but, but he went on to help us shape it, and it went on to be very successful. Later, when I was dean of the College of Engineering at UC Riverside, Carl once again stepped up and became my role model and mentor. He helped me think about the academic life. He helped me think about all the programs that we were starting, the research programs, but he also helped me how to balance a new family and my, my job as an academic. In 1995, I became executive director of the California Council on Science and Technology, and Carl was the chair of the board of directors. In this role, I had a chance to spend more time with Carl and with sorting out knotty problems that the state was facing, and I worked alongside Jud, Jud King and Charlie Kennel. Carl's firm, position, Carl's firm position from the beginning was that CCST would be independent of politics. That was a hard position to take in Sacramento. I remember very well during a board meeting, uh, a very senior state agency person came in and said, if the report that we are about to publish went public, that it should be modified first. Carl said that if that was the case, that he was going to pick up his football and go home. And there was dead silence in the room. The report was published. <laughs> Carl was immensely proud of his family and would tell me wonderful stories of family vacations together, cross-country skiing with grandchildren, and bricklaying in the backyard. He was my role model of what a father should be to his children, through thick and thin support, encourage, and give unconditional love. Carl introduced me to also to Embari, and I joined it as a member of the board of directors. At Embari, I remember his insistence at every single meeting there should be more engineering in ocean surveys. They took that to heart, and now they have the best fleet of, of, of robots, Bantic robot systems in the world. As many of you know, Carl also had a wonderful sense of humor. When Stephen Wolfram came out with his book, A New Kind of Science, I excitedly sent a copy to Carl with a message that Wolfram describes all sorts of new models. Carl answered me that he was disappointed they weren't the models he was looking for. <laughs> Carl also said, shared jokes that he exchanged with Judd King, in Latin, of course. <laughs> and he wrote to me in perfect Italian. My husband's Italian, so he wrote to me in perfect Italian. Very good. He also loved British TV. And I would send DVDs at Christmas to Carl and Rita every year. He especially liked Father Ted. Father Ted is an Irish TV series, which is extremely funny. Uh, it follows the life of three misfit priests who get uh, exiled onto an island, but they still manage to get up into all sorts of mischief. Carl also liked The Last of the Summer Wine, which is a very sweet story which follows the life of a group of eccentric aging people in a Yorkshire village, and all the antics that they get up to. I last spoke to Carl early this year, and he said that his joys in his life now are the dinners that he has with his children and the poetry and the books that he reads with Jermaine. Carl is missed, but the joy and the light he brought to the world is in all of us. The most important thing that Carl taught me was to act with extreme integrity in all things. He set the bar high, but it's a bar that I'm constantly reaching for. Thank you.
I was crying before I even came up here, so it's, who knows how it'll go. I feel very fortunate to have known Grandpa Carl, not only as a, a grandson um, in my childhood, but as a friend as I became an adult. Two and a half years ago, at the start of the lockdown, my wife uh, very thoughtfully suggested that I reach out to Grandpa and see how he was doing. Um, and what started as a few awkward text messages, some very concise replies from him, and a few thumbs up emojis, turned into a 10 to 20 minute Zoom call every Monday night for two years. Um, Grandpa, my wife, and I would catch up every, every Monday, and we would chat just to hear the news. We shared a lot of laughs and stories with uh, Grandpa's thumb, his ear, and his face. <laughs> for, all, for all the brilliant man that he was, could never really figure out the phone camera. <laughs> he was the first person we called after we got engaged. And sometimes, when we had a particularly boring week, I would think to myself, oh no, what are we gonna tell Grandpa? I don't want him to think that we're you know, doing nothing here. <laughs> Many weeks before the call, my wife and I would look at each other and we'd, we were so drained or exhausted just from the past couple days, but without fail, after we would look at each other and smile, just so full of energy and love, that was the effect that he had on us. Every time we chatted, he would just bring that to the conversation with, with all of his good humor and jokes. I love you, Grandpa, and I miss you. I hope wherever you are that you're still checking in every Monday. Um, we're thinking about you a lot. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Luke Brower. It's really awesome to see so many people here from my grandfather's life. There's so many amazing and very strong people here and it's really awesome to see and I'm sure he would be very grateful to see all his friends and family and colleagues here today. So we're all here for essentially one reason. We're here to celebrate the life of Carl S. Piester. So for many of you, he was, like I said, a colleague. Maybe it was your father, your brother. To me, he was a mentor, a teacher, and also my grandfather. He was a great man in many ways. Many of those ways have already been spoken of today, and I'm sure many more ways will be spoken of in the future. I want to focus on essentially how my grandfather shaped my life, specifically within the last three years. To begin, Grandpa had always encouraged me to set big dreams and big goals for my life. But unfortunately, I didn't really know what my passion was until I was 19, which was about three years ago. Grandpa really encouraged me to apply to San Jose State University and to study computer science. And prior to this, I had spent much of my life working jobs I had no interest in and studying in majors that I had no passion for. So this change was a very pivotal moment in my life. Two years later, three years later, here I am. I'm very proud of what I've accomplished and I just think about where I could be today if I hadn't listened to him. If I hadn't listened to his advice or his encouragement or his motivation, where would I be now? Grandpa had always wanted me to be an academic I think he really wanted me to follow in his footsteps, to get my master's degree, to get a doctorate, but I didn't really share those aspirations. But I do have a plan in mind that I think is gonna bring a smile to his face. So for those who don't know, earning an internship in the software engineering field is pretty difficult and requires a great commitment of time. You must be a strong communicator and you must use your technical skills to solve problems. 
these skills are not something most software engineers or maybe even engineers are going to have naturally. Sometimes they're not even taught in classes, which is unfortunate. The journey to prepare for your software engineering interview can be very taxing on both your mental health and your physical health, and I definitely speak from experience with that. I want to help fix this. One of my future goals, one of my future goals is to start a club or a class at San Jose State University after I graduate. I would want to focus on teaching beginner computer science students how to be strong communicators while also improving their ability to solve technical coding problems, which is certainly a requirement for my field as well as the industry. I believe this will strongly reduce the anxiety and imposter syndrome that many students like myself face when they are preparing for this monumental task. I think it's critical that we teach students the skills to acquire jobs and also the skills to teach them or to keep the job. While I'm sure this isn't exactly what grandpa wanted for me, it's not me getting my master's or my doctorate, I'm sure he'd be proud of the effort I have in store for this plan and this program. Thank you all for coming today and taking the time to be here with the family and colleagues. I'm sure if he were to see this, he would be very grateful to see all of his students, friends, colleagues, and family here today celebrating his life. Thank you. President Drake, Dean Liu, distinguished officers and faculty, friends, family. Today we've heard a fair amount about my father, the professor, dean, chancellor, vice president, but he was also the son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, gardener, plumber, electrician, carpenter, painter, laborer in the fields. And that's the man I'd like to talk about today. He was a man of faith, dedicated to his family, a lover of music who could sing Gregorian chant, and a lover of nature, a man of principles with a great capacity to love. It's really impossible to talk about dad without including our mother in the discussion. They complemented and completed each other. Throughout their marriage, our parents experienced the roller coaster of family life, great highs and great lows, happiness and sadness, and great success. But I won't say failure because there was none of that. Our parents taught us simple principles, love and respect others, be honest, help those who are less fortunate, achieve the very best that you can, read, question, learn, value, creativity, and diversity. They encouraged us to think for ourselves, goodness knows we could use a little bit more of that today, and to reach for the stars. When mom and dad were young and eager and the family was starting to grow, our two-bedroom apartment in Oakland was no longer sufficient for our needs, so the two adventurers bought a vacant lot on a rather steep hill in Lafayette. My mother designed the house, and it was built by my two grandfathers. The house was perched near the top of the hill, so a long and twisted road had to be graded in order to reach the house from the street. Many tons of gravel went into that road over the years. It was treacherous in winter, but we loved riding our bikes down the hill frequently at breakneck speed. It's a wonder that no bones were ever broken. Dad was well acquainted with the shovel and pick. He planted hundreds of plants and trees on the property, built fences, stairs, retaining walls, a sandbox, poured concrete patios, and put in an irrigation system using steel pipe before PVC and glue improved that process. He was very protective of the yard and put, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> early on, he declared a vendetta against gophers which was later expanded to include deer 
and eventually wild turkeys. <laughs> he had a BB gun for the turkeys, but he never set it strong enough to hurt them, only enough to encourage them to leave. With a family of eight, dad's time in the Navy came in handy. We had a remarkably organized and structured home life. The kids all had daily chores on which we alternated each week. Set the table, clear the table, wash the dishes, head captain. Remember, he was in the Navy. I remember well our family dinners in the 1960s. During the first part of the meal, we talked about many subjects, the Vietnam War, the church, politics, social issues. Nothing was off limits. And it was fairly loud with that big a crowd. An essential part of the dinner experience was the dictionary. Whenever a word would come up that we didn't know, dad, always the educator, would pull out the dictionary and read the definition for our general enlightenment. Dessert was adult talking time. We could sit there and eat our Lucerne ice cream with Hershey's chocolate sauce, but we couldn't talk. So as you can imagine, we would usually finish our ice cream fairly quickly and ask to be excused. In the fall of 1965, the family went to Europe. Dad took a sabbatical and was fortunate to obtain a Fulbright lectureship at University College in Cork, Ireland. By this time, there were six kids. I was 14, and my little brother, now Dr. Christopher Peaster, was in diapers. Can you imagine taking that crowd across the Atlantic? We spent the academic year in Ireland and camped in Europe during the Easter break and the summer. While I think now that it was a crazy thing for them to do, the opportunity to experience different cultures and see the magnificent art and architecture of Rome, Venice, Milan, and many other places was life-changing. I developed a fascination for Gothic cathedrals. My mother shared this interest, but my sisters did not. They protested every time we stopped to visit another cathedral. Dad was a great lover of nature, as you've heard, and particularly of the Sierras. In 1946, his parents acquired the right to build a cabin on a lot in the National Forest at Capels Lake, not far from Kirkwood, at an altitude of nearly 8,000 feet. And build it they did with hand saws and hand drills. Once we were old enough, we went there many times over the years, sometimes with mom and dad, and sometimes with my grandparents when they were still living. It's not difficult to appreciate the beauty of God's creation in the mountains, valleys, lakes, creeks, and night skies of the Sierras. I know my dad did. Religion was an important part of our family life. We went to mass every Sunday and sat in the front row. We knew every saint's feast day. We observed Lent and Advent, drew religious pictures on Good Friday, sang carols every Christmas Eve. Our parents taught us about Jesus and the apostles, read to us from the Bible, and we said our prayers every night. Mom and dad were ecumenical before, that, um, before anybody really knew what that word meant. We had a steady stream of Catholic and non-Catholic guests, a lot to listen to during the adult part of dinner. But for mom and dad, it was an opportunity to help bring people together to learn about each other and find common ground. When I think of my mom and dad, I see them at many levels and layers. But what stands out to me now and will for my lifetime is that they were always shining examples of unconditional love. Whether they approved of what we did or didn't do never mattered. We frequently didn't make it easy for them, but they always loved us without reservation. After mom's death 11 years ago, dad's love didn't diminish. If anything, it grew to fill the void of her absence. Love has been a salvation for me. When our mother died, the family drew noticeably to closer together. We helped each other weather the storm of grief then, and we're doing the same now. We learned this love from our parents who learned it from theirs. 
Love has been a unifier in our family, and for that, I am deeply grateful. But none of this should come as a surprise. My mother was a third order secular Franciscan, and my father may, might as well have been. They both embraced the Franciscan principles of charity, selflessness, humility, peace, and love. They even named me Carl Francis. Regrettably, when I was young, I tended to boss my little sisters around. I can't tell you how many times my mom told me that St. Francis was a peacekeeper, peacemaker, and so should I be. I'm afraid I was never very good at it. So following the theme of love that was so strongly present in dad's life, the family has invited Father Joseph Kenichi to share some of his thoughts about our father. Dad and Father Joe knew each other for many years, first professionally, through the Franciscan School of Theology at the Graduate Theological Union, and later as close friends who shared similar views on faith, family, and many other topics. Pace e bene, Father Joe. Thanks, Carl. Pace bene a tutti. It's a great honor for me to give a benediction at this memorial for Carl. As president of the Franciscan School of Theology, I worked with Carl for 20 years. We became great friends, as all of you are. Carl found his spiritual home in our Franciscan family, led there by his beloved wife, Rita. Once there, he embodied the commitment to the fullest. In 2018, our Graduate School of Theology awarded Carl an honorary doctorate. His acceptance speech went to the heart of why I am here today. And I quote, two of the most significant experiences of my life, Carl proclaimed, are my long career at the University of California and my affiliation with the Franciscan School of Theology. For me, these two experiences are connected in two understandings of the word light as sources of energy for understanding and sustaining life in its broadest terms. Many of you know much more than I do the first meaning of light, a cosmological explosion at the foundation of the universe, light space, time, coming to fruition in the sun, without which we would not exist, and to beauty in something as visibly spectacular as a rainbow. Once at the house that Carl mentioned, over Manhattans, which Carl was very good at making, over Manhattan, sitting on the back porch with Carl and peering out at the universe of trees and flowers and mountains and cities, recipients of a spectacular sunset in front of us, Carl looked at me and said, Joe, this is my cathedral. When he spoke with me a few days before he died, he simply said, you know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to seeing the universe in all its grandeur, how it was made and how it works. To shed academic light on Carl's Cathedral of Life in all of its dimensions is the purpose of the university, Fiat Lux. The second meaning of light for Carl, closely joined to the first, is Lumen Christi, the light of Christ, through whom, in faith, Carl believed this world was created. As with the Big Bang, Carl spoke a similar force is the force of love, shaping the why of creation and evolution of the universe and the tree of life experienced and observed, we observe it today, but invisible. 
The force of love expressed in the physics of light condensed into a big bang. And the person of the one who says, I am the light of the world, united in Karl Piester in an extraordinary way. In honor of Karl, let me conclude with one of his favorite poems from Francis of Assisi, The Canticle of Creatures. Most high, all powerful, good Lord, Yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, and the blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no human is worthy to mention your name. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light, and he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness of you most high. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister moon and the stars. In heaven you form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praise be you, my Lord, through brother fire, through whom you light the night. And he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, they will be crowned. And on this day, let me add my own verse. Praise be you, Most High, for our brother, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and colleague, mentor, Carl Piester, in whom you taught us all the beauty, brilliance, and precision of an intellect of great insight in service to the good of all, through whose creative hands you showed us how to work administer and lead with humility and vision, with whom you gathered and formed us into a community of learning, giving witness to the human dignity of each person on this earth, from whose life and love and family you have given us a living example of honesty, fidelity, perseverance, and patience. Praised be to you, Most High, for your mercy and forgiveness that we now ask for your servant, Carl. Praise be to you, Most High, for our brother Jesus and our most dear friend, Carl, made in the image of your own beloved son, his light illuminating through Carl the path of the universe redeemed through the life and labors of your incarnate mercy, drawing us through Carl into a better world, filled with the Holy Spirit, whose energy of love burned in Carl's heart to inflame us with your wisdom. Praise be to you, Most High, for the gift of Carl Piester whom we now return to you in great thanksgiving. Amen.
Thank you to all of our speakers. It was wonderful to hear those stories. Uh, thank you to all of you. I hope that you can join us and share more stories uh, over food and, and beverages outside. And this is a celebration. And uh, my dad would want us to, to be happy and to leave it that way. So on three, we're going to go bears, all right? And I don't want it to be anemic. <laughs> One, two, three. Go Bears!